um, this is just buffering here on Facebook, I think. Hang on one check. Judy. And they were live on, face, on Facebook. Yeah, and they're like, there's a two second delay as well. So sometimes when I'm going back and forth between the screens, because, you know, people question over on Facebook too, because they may not have emailed to get the link. Um, you can hear my voice in the background from the other thing, you know, so it's like, oh. Uh, so I guess we're ready. Um, everyone, that we've got about 13 live with us here and I know they'll be filtering and so I'll keep an eye on the room and we're live on Facebook. Welcome members and friends of the Irish American Heritage Museum in Albany. I often forget to give that introduction, particularly, particularly when I'm the speaker because I'm already thinking about my speech. <laughs> so I don't have to do the talking tonight. It's all down to Peter Maloney, PhD, who's from County Limerick, only over the road from where I am in Kerry. He's from Abbey Field and uh, living here in the capital uh, district and spoke for us many times in the past. In fact, did a, a kind of a modern Ireland, um, the Mike Carroll lecture series uh, in 2019, 2018. So we're delighted to have him back with us to talk to us about Brexit. Where are we now? And if anyone knows where we are, and I'm not sure, to be honest, that even Peter knows where we are, but he'll certainly <laughs> help us to make sense of what's going on with uh, the UK and Northern Ireland and the Southern Ireland and borders and customs and everything. So without further ado, Peter, I'll send it over to you. I'm just going to make sure that um, the speaker view is on. And I'm going to share. So you tell me when to move on with the yeah the sure slides. Okay, and I'm going to share this now. Okay, I see it. Okay, let me just make it be. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So good evening, everyone. I'm glad uh, to be with you tonight. Uh, thanks for for tuning in or logging in or whatever in you did. Um, we're going to talk tonight about something which we've touched on before, as Elizabeth said in previous um, talks. So because I've kind of covered this before, I'm going to give you a shortened history uh, and we'll focus on the what's happened recently and hopefully what, what will happen. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll start. So Elizabeth, you can go to the next slide. So this uh, picture is, um, I mean, the disunited kingdom, that's it's a kind of a, kind of a a bold question, but my, my point is that it's, um, oh, let me go back. Yeah. Okay, uh, is that it's, it's not the UK it used to be. Um, you kind of, your parents, your grandparents, UK was, you know, uh, a single country, you know, ruling the waves, whatever it did. Um, but today it's actually um, four different countries with four separate parliaments and Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales have pretty strong autonomy uh, in terms of what they do in terms of tax, transport, education. For example, if you're an American student and you go to Edinburgh to study, you probably will not be in contact with the British Education Board. You're gonna be in contact with the Scottish Education Board. So there's a lot of autonomy there, which has grown over the past 20 plus years because of devolution, the, the, the devolved powers to the regions. Uh, as we all know, they chose to depart the EU numerically. Uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland uh, voted Remain, uh, but because England is such a large uh, country, about 80% of the UK population, their vote carried the day, but um, it was still it was obviously very controversial uh, when, it, when it happened. Uh, the EU itself is, is destination for 44%, so almost half of UK exports. So it's a very big risk. It's a very big change. Uh, by taking so much of your exports and, and putting it um, in a different category, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. So what's the plan? Well, insofar as there is a plan, the, the, the goal of the British government is to have a global Britain. So it's setting sail, kind of harking back to ruling the waves and kind of, you know, on their merry way around the world, making wonderful deals with different countries. That's a matter of opinion, uh, which maybe we'll get to later. Uh, but that's their goal, to be flexible, to be uh, nimble, uh, and not to be part of a huge market. So the last point is um, uh, the union, the UK was created officially about 300 years ago. Um, this is one of the fundamental like generational changes that can potentially threaten the integrity of the UK. So a 300 year old union for reasons we'll get to later uh, is genuinely at risk. I'm not saying it will happen, but there's definitely a risk that it, it, will, uh, it will break up. Uh, okay, thank Elizabeth, next one. Okay, sorry, uh, someone is coming in as well. 
Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, now this is a kind of a weird one, but um, <laughs> only one of these characters is happy because of, of, of Brexit. Anyone hazard a guess as to which one? Ooh. I don't know. It's a fisherman? I don't know. <laughs> no, no, they're, they're definitely- They're open arms, yeah, I forgot that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Pig. The pig, yeah, and I'll get to that. Why? So Elton John and Andrew Campbell and, and other artists have to get visas now. British people have to get visas for each country they play in in Europe, which was not the case for the past forty four years. So that's a complication and a cost. Fishermen, uh, yeah, I forgot. Oh, it's like one percent of GDP. Um, it was a huge issue during Brexit negotiations. Uh, and they kind of fudged it a little bit, but the, the fishing industry is not happy with it, so they're not happy. Uh, the bottom right is the city of London. Uh, they feel a bit uh, left out too by the British government. Uh, they don't think that they've been looked after, and, and the, the city of London and, and the, the financial center is a huge part of the British economy. The only happy one is the pig up on the left, because, because of uh, Brexit, uh, approximately 100,000 British pigs have not been slaughtered um, and exported to the to the EU because of trade uh, obstacles. So there you go. The, ha the only happy one is the pig. Mm. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, so um, as I said, I'll give you a quick background. I'm, I'm a history PhD, so I, I just can't help myself. Um, this is, um, in terms of background, the EU came from the European. Oh, we're jumping ahead. Mm -hmm. The EU came from the European Economic Community which was created in the 50s, 1957. Uh, and the founding countries were six countries who basically got together because economically they were in trouble. Uh, the war had devastated Europe. Um, politically, they were becoming irrelevant because you had the Cold War, you had the Soviet Union and the US. So they kind of got together to kind of to protect each other in a sense uh, and also to succeed I mean, for sure. So the UK was invited, uh, but it decided to stay out um, of the negotiations. Then suddenly in the space of 10 years, they decided that maybe it's a good idea to join. So they, they joined in 1973. But the problem for them, and this has kept dogging them throughout, is that the DNA of the European economic community was created already before the British were involved. So they had to accept whatever was decided before. Now, they joined in 73 based on an act of parliament, not a referendum, and that's important to remember, which we'll get to, uh, under a conservative party government, the Prime Minister Ted Heath. Uh, and that's also important because it's the conservatives who also uh, brought them out. Next slide. So this is David Cameron, the uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, who brought about the referendum. Um, and the path to 2016 was, I mean, yeah, like you can go back for a long time, but the most recent, kind of the shortest path, it kind of starts to turn after the crisis of 08. As we all know, 2008 was a pretty miserable year, although I guess we hadn't seen 2020 yet in, in 08. But, uh, 08 was a fairly miserable year. Um, and the UK were, 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 were always an awkward partner in Europe, but the Euro crisis forced them to say to their partners who had the euro, the UK does not have the euro, we do not, we're not interested in bailing you out, okay? And that kind of creates divisions within the EU uh, and, and the UK is unhappier, is more unhappy. And domestically, the UK Independence Party, UKIP, is busy drumming up support for a referendum to leave the EU. And they have a tiny, tiny number of supporters, but they're loud, they're very clever, uh, and they push they push all the right buttons that 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 the conservatives uh, that concerns the conservatives. They're stealing votes from the from the conservative party, and that's a concern. So what do they do? The conservatives tend to move towards the UKIP um, approach just to gain back their voters. 2010, uh, this prime minister David Cameron he says basically to kind of calm down a part of his own party. Not, he didn't have any great vision of Brexit. Uh, he himself was for Remain. He said, just to calm down the, 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 the people in his own party, he'll give them a referendum. And he doesn't feel confident that they're, they're gonna lose it. Um, little did he know. Uh, and to give you an idea of how unthreatened he might've felt, in 2012, only 4% put the EU of the British public, put the EU at the top of their list of concerns. 
So there was lots of other things to worry about besides membership of the EU. Yet within four years, they're out. So what happened? Well, a lot of things happened, kind of a perfect storm. You had the lingering effects of uh, the, de the depression, if you like, the, the, the crisis. Uh, you had the Euro crisis, you had UKIP. Um, and in 2015, Cameron um, officially launches a renegotiation of terms of British membership with the hope that he can present it to the British people. He's promised a referendum. He's hoping to present it to the people and get a better deal. Now, what happens is he negotiates terms. They're not very different. People see right through this. They decide, you know what? It's not actually worth it. By a very narrow margin, by like one and a half percent, they decide to leave, but democracy is democracy uh, and, they, and they leave. The issues at the time uh, were many, but some of these might be familiar to you uh, in the US too. Sovereignty, who controls what? Who is accountable for political decisions and political action? Is it London? Is it Brussels? Uh, and people have a problem if it's one or the other, uh, but the British people felt that it was time to bring power back to Westminster, back to, to the UK. Um, globalization, it's a very broad term, but the idea being, uh, you know, hyper free market, um, maximized trade, uh, lower wages, more jobs maybe, but, but, but lower wages and more insecure jobs. Uh, immigration, I don't have to remind Americans what an issue that can be. Uh, it's very controversial. Uh, and the UKIP party pushed those buttons very on the edge sometimes, but very, very, very strongly. Okay, next slide. Oh, okay, I forgot about this one. So what's this boat doing in the middle of my presentation? Well, I wanna show you, I mean, we all probably agree that democracy is a good thing. Uh, people get a voice and the majority rules. The problem is sometimes democracy doesn't go the way you think it's gonna go. This is an Arctic explorer ship. Taxpayers paid for this in Britain and the government thought, let's have a wonderful idea Let's get people to vote for a, a name of this ship. And, you know, the Winston Churchill or David Attenborough or whatever it might be. Does anyone know what the name the public chose for this boat was? Boaty Mac Boatface or something terribly stupid. <laughs> Boaty Mac Boatface yeah. <laughs> was the winning vote of the British people. So I think that's all I need to say on that. Uh, they didn't go with it in the end because <laughs> yeah. they felt that it was stupid. Um, but just to show you where democracy sometimes uh, can go a little bit off, off kilter. Next slide. Okay, so the vote itself, I, I remember this night very well. I was driving back from Boston and, and I stayed up pretty much all night to watch this. Um, as you can see from the map, and you're all probably aware of this, that the areas in, in green here voted medium or strongly to remain, and the areas in yellow and red to, to, to leave. Now, if you look, there's so many divisions here. There's geographical division, Scotland, Northern Ireland versus England and Wales. There's regional division, London city, uh, the, the coastal areas uh, are, are remain, uh, the, the heartland of, of the former British industrial complex in the north is leave. So you have a lot of conflict. You have, you have ethnic conflict, Scots versus English. Uh, you have generational conflict. You have... Um, uh, class and education, it all comes into it. And tensions that existed in Britain but weren't on the surface, for some reason, Brexit was the button that was the catalyst that brought them all to the surface. So a very, very existential moment, uh, a Brexitential moment uh, at the time. England and Wales vote leave. Uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland vote remain. But because the majority are in England um, and Wales, the Scottish and Northern Irish vote, in a sense, doesn't count. And that's a huge constitutional time bomb. Now, we don't need to be reminded that people in Northern Ireland are not afraid to express their political rights, and, and rightly so. They were pretty pissed. The Scots were annoyed. Uh, all kinds of stuff went on. And the problem is, the fundamental problem is, the British Constitution, which doesn't physically exist, it's kind of a gentleman's agreement over the years, uh, that's fine and flexible. But there was no mechanism for controlling a referendum that went against the parliament. And you had a, a situation in Britain in June 24, 2016, where the people went against the views of the parliament. The parliament would have voted remain, the people voted leave. 
Now that's a huge constitutional problem because what is democracy? It's the people's voice but the people have elected these representatives to act on their behalf. So you have kind of a headless chicken moment where they just don't have a plan. Uh, They did not expect to lose. They did not expect leave to win. And there is just a vacuum um, after the vote is, 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 uh, is counted. And um, it's, it's still to this day, a constitutional, a huge constitutional mess. They just had no plan. Um, And that was a, a big problem. Next slide. So these are a few uh, headlines from the next day. Um, Now, the interesting thing here is that the prime minister resigns. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that's kind of second class news. The main event is we've left or the UK has left the EU. Like on on any other day, the prime minister resigning suddenly would definitely be front and center uh, out there. And the mirror uh, uh, headline is is quite uh, effective. Uh, So what the hell happens now? Uh, that was definitely people's questions. I mean, the funny thing was, I heard that the the, the strong, the, the the most popular Google search term on June twenty fourth in Britain was "What is the European Union?" Enough said. Next slide. Okay, uh, you could do a whole presentation on the Irish border, but I'm I'm kind of touching on it. But it is very important, and hopefully, we'll get to it in questions. Um, on the left, for, for those of you who can remember way back not too far, I guess, but there were customs uh, checkpoints. I mean, there were like 200 roads into Northern Ireland from the South and the chances of you smuggling stuff over were pretty good. Uh, It's just they had to, on the main roads, they had to at least demonstrate that there was some kind of customs. So people had to stop and show their car, what's in their car and and then be checked. Uh, On the left, the bottom left here, you have military checkpoints, which was a a fact of life uh, in Northern Ireland for many years. Uh, and um, definitely a focus point, focal point of, of power military um, uh, reprisals, uh, but also um, a very stark reminder that this is not normal times. In the middle, we have today. We have pretty much like you'd see between Massachusetts and New York. You just you just drive on through. There's nothing there, and that's because of the single market where the UK, Northern Ireland, and the Republic have been in the same, or were now, in the same single market, it was as if you were going across county borders as opposed to an international border, which it was, but because it's in a single market, it was in a single market, uh, you could fly back and forth. You hopefully stay within the speed limit, but you could technically fly back and forth. Uh, The bottom image is is, uh, one of many posters in the border area basically saying respect the vote. Um, and that was a major issue. How do you square the circle of Northern Ireland wants to remain, but the UK wants to leave? On the right uh, is not even on the island of Ireland. It's the border between uh, France and Switzerland. So an EU border. This is what an EU border looks like between countries uh, on the mainland. That cannot, that cannot That's what people are trying to avoid in Northern Ireland. And that was the whole crux of the negotiations over the Irish border, having it on land like this, or having it on the sea where it's a little bit more fluid and a bit more distant from people. In the end, they chose the sea border, but that creates its own kind of worms where you have the unionist population crying foul because they feel they're being treated as second class citizens. We'll probably get to this during the Q&A. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm kind of flying through stuff here, but um, I want to give you a gist. Dead cats and lively debate. What do I mean by that? Well, there were no cats injured in the process of negotiation, as far as I know. Uh, but a dead cat is a kind of a political term, a negotiation term, where if things are kind of awkward or, or you're not making progress, you throw something that is totally ludicrous onto the table, a dead cat, and people jump up and forget their problems and say, oh my God, it's a dead cat on the table. And it, it just creates a new atmosphere. Not always positive, but a new atmosphere. Now, the dead cat that the British threw up last year was a UK internal market bill, which suggested that um, once they've left the EU, um, they have the power to create the border wherever they want it to be. Okay, That's kind of taking a very unilateral approach to what should have been an international agreement. And that frightened the life out of the Europeans 
And they came back to the table. And as we all know, <clears throat> they created a deal. Uh, Christmas Eve, I think, was, the, was, a, was a deal. Um, it was finally set. Um, and that was part of negotiating tactics. Uh, in the end, everyone apparently got what they wanted. Nobody was happy, but uh, we sailed forward to January 1st and we can touch on what happened, but it, it definitely wasn't plain sailing. Now, a few things I want to bring to your, to your uh, notice is that in the month or more that we've had of official Brexit, it's been kind of masked by COVID and COVID kind of messes everything up. So you can't say lines at the border, decrease in trade is because of Brexit, because COVID is there and doing having the same effect. So it won't be till COVID has dissipated that you're really gonna see the, you can actually nail an impact on Brexit alone. But one thing that has changed has, and this is not due to COVID, is transport trucks that go from Ireland to the EU have pretty much always used the land bridge of the UK because they're all in the same market, just fly on through. Since January 1st, the capacity between Ireland and France has expanded like three and four fold because truck companies are deciding to not bother with the hassle of British ports and just going around uh, directly to France. And once they arrive in France, there is no border, there is no customs check and they go right on through. Now, that's a huge, fun, that's a fundamental change of trading patterns, which I think will have a big impact if it continues. Uh, and the British economy will suffer because of that. And the final thing I want to mention on this slide is Article 16, you may have heard of, there's so many articles, but this is the, the most recent controversy where the EU, kind of stupidly really, uh, it, was a, it, was an, it was kind of a, an administrative mess um, they said because of COVID vaccination uh, going better in Britain than in the EU, they wanted to prevent vaccines going into Britain. They wanted to keep it for the EU citizens. Some bright, bright spark in the commission said, let's bring Article 16 from the uh, withdrawal agreement into effect. Now, what Article 16 does is it allows a country unilaterally, the EU or the UK, to effectively make it null and void. Uh, you kind of suspend it for a while uh, and it freezes um, the, the deal. So you're, you're basically um, getting rid of uh, the terms of the deal. Uh, and it's a very powerful tool. And no one thought anybody would use it soon, but it turned out to be the EU. Uh, and the British have jumped on this be, uh, because they see it as a mistake by the EU. And they are using it as a reason to say, well, we can't trust them. They clearly don't know what they're doing. And it was a really embarrassing moment for the EU. And I think a real shooting themselves in the foot moment. Uh, and that brings in the whole Northern Irish border, which we've touched on. Um, at the moment, it's still on the Irish Sea uh, and everyone's trying to avoid it being uh, on land. Next slide. Okay, <clears throat> um, so a few pictures here, just to kind of give you an idea of what's changed in the past month. On the left here, you have uh, traffic jams um, in UK ports. Again, you could say this is Brexit, you could say this is COVID, no one quite knows, uh, but it is not good. In the middle, you have customs declaration forms among uh, or from Britain to the EU countries. Uh, that hasn't been in existence for decades. It's now back in. My sister works for eBay in Ireland, and she said she fields calls from people, hundreds of people a day basically complaining, why should we have to pay five pounds more for my teapot that I'm buying from France? The reason is UK left the EU, uh, there is a customs cost and you have to pay it. So that, that's just the way it is. Uh, pet passports used to be, you could just drive in and out of the mainland from Britain. Now you have to get special paperwork, special, it just a, it's a slower process for people who want to bring their pet uh, to Europe. Bottom left, Huge warehouses exist in Northern France where pretty much most of their clientele are British alcohol seekers um, who stock up in France with cheap wine, cheap booze and bring it back. <clears throat> I mean, it's kind of like New Hampshire, I guess, over here, but they bring it back. And this really is no longer gonna work because you have to pay customs as you cross the border now. And that's totally put a spanner in the works of, of these industries. And the last one is, uh, for those of you who've been to airports in Europe, uh, the left lane, blue lane here, 
uh, will now disappear from British airports because they're not in the EU uh, and you're back to the green and the orange um, line. So there, there is fundamental changes uh, definitely already after a month. Next slide. Okay, the good news is my last slide. So uh, I'll make it brief. What's gonna happen? I, who knows? Uh, but all we can do is, is kind of best estimate uh, what will happen. Um, the UK, as I said at the start, is setting out to make new deals across the world. That's its goal. It has not negotiated a deal on its own behalf, a trade deal on its own behalf in 47 years, because the European Commission negotiates international trade deals on behalf of member states in the EU. Now the British are on their own. They are free to, to, to trade, free to negotiate. Uh, just they don't have the experience um, that they would have had in the past. Scotland is going to be interesting because there are elections, there are national parliamentary elections in Scotland in May. And the fear is in London, <clears throat> excuse me, that the Scottish the Brexit is a fundamental change and will push the Scots towards supporting this national Scottish National Party, supporting Scottish independence, and it will radicalize the population of Scotland. It has definitely ticked up support for independence, but it's still pretty close. So that could be a turning point. If there's a strong support for the Scottish National Party, that could cause trouble uh, down the road in terms of Scotland trying to break away. Northern Ireland flashpoint. I mean, doesn't we, we don't need much imagination to, to realize that Northern Ireland is still a very fragile region, very fragile place. Um, and it's only 30 years ago, uh, people were killing each other. Uh, they're still here. They're still there, those people who 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 still carry that memory. And uh, it's it's a place you don't wanna mess with in terms of um, how they're organized and how their daily life works. Um, why, should you, why should Americans be concerned? Well, even if you're not interested in Irish affairs, uh, there are 15 million jobs on both sides of the Atlantic directly because of American foreign direct investment in Europe or European foreign direct investment in the US. That's a lot of jobs. Uh, the trade flows between Europe and the U.S. account for one third of the entire global trade flow, over five and a half trillion uh, dollars. That is problematic. Why? Because Britain will now negotiate on its own behalf. Um, it's American firms who base themselves in Britain because it was a stepping stone into the free market, into the single market in Europe, now face a dilemma. Do we leave Britain? go to Ireland, go to France, go to Denmark, um, and that's a problem. Uh, Trojan horse, what does that mean? Well, traditionally, the Americans viewed the British not as their spy, it's a bit strong, but as their kind of conduit for information, what's happening at the table in Europe, uh, and the British were, were a special relationship. Uh, the Americans relied on the British to give them um, information uh, that would be relevant to them. The British are no, no longer at the table uh, of the EU. Uh, so for American the administration over here, Britain has effectively pegged itself down in terms of national international influence. And that's a problem. Uh, political stability, Northern Ireland is an obvious case, but also uh, the mainland Britain itself, uh, Scotland, uh, and even regions within England. And I'm going to finish with a phrase that I think I've used before, but I like it because it kind of sums it up. Even though it's from 1975, when the first referendum happened, and that, I didn't mention that, but there has been a referendum before, and it actually voted yes to remain, so there was no problem. Um, Christopher Soames is the grand, was the grandson of, of uh, Winston Churchill. He was also a British minister, uh, and also later a European commissioner, so he kind of bridges both. Uh, and back in the referendum period in 75, he came up with the phrase, the question, does Britain want part of a reality or the whole of an illusion? Now, it's 40 plus years ago since he said that, but there are definitely echoes of, of truth in that phrase in terms of what Britain is seeking, what the UK is seeking for itself uh, in the future. Okay, with that, I'm gonna stop um, and uh, I'm welcome, uh, any questions? Okay, great. Um, so Bob had asked a red herring. I think, Bob, that was during, you, um, uh, I can't remember when you posed that, <laughs> which slide that was on. 
Was it about? I think it was a dead cat. Cats? The dead cat the dead slide. Cat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, good. Mm -hmm. oh, right. So, um, do you think those just are stall tactics or red herrings, Peter? Um, well, I, the problem with the the uh, internal market bill back last year, the kind of the dead cat they threw up, was that they were going to break international law. Mm -hmm. They admitted that, yet they continued as if they were going to do that. So they were trying to call the bluff of the EU. And in a sense, they did. Uh, the, the EU said, okay, listen, we'll, we'll figure something out. Uh, we just don't want you to, to break the law. <laughs> I mean, and you think the British wouldn't have to be reminded of that, but um, uh, for a country that's seeking new trade deals around the world and new relationships, a track record of breaking international law will, uh, willingly uh, is not a good way to start. Mm -hmm. um, I think I see Betty typing. And everyone else, you know, if you have a question, do put it into the chat. It'll just be easier instead of, you know, 16 voices. Um, I, I, we got a comment on Facebook um, about the Northern Ireland. You know, people are not able to get things from top shop like or, or companies that they've dealt with, you know, for next all these companies. So how how is that going to be? And I know you're probably right, like that COVID, of course, has come, you know, uh, making everything more complicated than it needs to be. But that is going to be a serious, you know, I think going forward, if people cannot get deliveries, it's not even that they have to pay the extra money, they're not delivering to Northern Ireland at the moment. So how is that going to work? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the goal of, of, of the current agreement was Northern Ireland would have the best of both worlds. It would be part of the UK, which technically, politically it is, and it would at the same time be in the European single market. So you know, the likes of Bailey's Irish Cream, for example. Mm -hmm. Bailey's Irish Cream is made from very good milk up in the border area. But to get your bottle of Bailey's, the milk and the products and the, and, and the alcohol crosses the border many, many times during production. Mm -hmm. And it's been that way, for, you know, it's been that way for a long time. And a land border there would, Bailey's is an example, would disrupt the economic uh, well-being of, uh, of the region uh, for sure. So people trying to avoid at all costs a land border, besides the potential for violence, uh, economically it is, um, it is a, real, uh, a real threat. Uh, a, a good example of um, how intertwined the North and South are, even though they're two technically different countries, is that there is a single electricity grid for the whole country. Mm -hmm. It's one unit. Um, there's also the fact that I just found out recently, which kind of surprised me, we do not mill wheat in Ireland. So literally our daily bread depends on British milling um, and, and Northern Irish milling. And that's, if there's a border there, it slows things down and it, it, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so Betty's question, I think, oh no, this is from Cathy and Chris. Uh, you mentioned international trade. I've read in the UK and Canadian sources about a movement called Kanzuk or Canada, uh, New Zealand, I guess, UK, to foster free trade and closer ties among UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, reality or pipe dream. I mean, you would think with the Commonwealth. And what is Ireland's stake in such a movement? Uh, hi, I think Chris, how are you doing? Hope you're doing well. Um, yeah, so... I mean, part of, of the British goal is to create new deals mm -hmm. uh, and this they have to explore everything because they have a big gaping hole in their in their export uh, flow. So part of it is the obvious kind of one is the old Commonwealth connections, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. That's fine to an extent, but geographical proximity is the largest driver of trade in the world. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. You try, you know, if you're sending the, like the pig we saw earlier on. If you're sending livestock, you're not going to send livestock to New Zealand. They don't need it because they have lots of it themselves. But um, there's only a limited amount of things you can trade with New Zealand and Australia and even Canada because of the time difference, because of the distance and the cost in shipping stuff. Uh, I did hear a story where they're also looking to join the, um, the Pacific uh, Trade Pact that the U US withdrew from four years ago. Again, that's fine. It's a new market. It's just the products that you can send there are limited because of just being so far away. 
the, the, so the most the strongest driving point for for trade is proximity. So your neighbors uh, are the ones who are going to trade with you most. It kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a risk. I mean, they have to explore everything, but it's a real challenge to negotiations don't happen in weeks, even months. They can take a long time. And my thought is that Britain in the end will be okay. UK will be fine. It's just the short to medium term is looking very choppy. Mm -hmm. um well, yeah, and when you think, look at how strict, you know, Australia and New Zealand are about bringing things in. And now with COVID locked down, you know, they, they're not particularly reliant on trade, you would think. Um, it's not a good, yes, it's not a good moment to be uh, setting sail for, yeah. for sure. Uh, Pete, and then I'll, I'll ask you a question, then, Betty, but Peter asked, will British tightening immigration laws affect immigration to Ireland? <sighs> well, because um, Ireland and the, UK, and the UK have this pre-existing common travel area that existed since independence so 100 years ago mm -hmm. we as irish people can still freely go into britain and back so it's a kind of a derogation from the immigration the, the main british concern for immigration was eastern europe mm -hmm. uh, they didn't want uh, cheap labor coming in uh, stealing british jobs as they claimed um, and it's it's the irish connection is is so old that it's not really an issue uh, for immigration because I mean, I, I've, I've lived in Britain and, and, and some of you have too, like you blend in, like you're, you're, you're fairly close culturally to, 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 the British, um, to the British culture. So Ireland was, Irish immigrants were never an issue uh, in Britain. Uh, it was the Eastern Europeans principally that, that kind of scared people into voting for Brexit. And we do have that kind of special relationship, you know, and, and a lot of English people don't realize that we're an independent country. You know, they're like, that was part of the blowback of the whole Brexit thing was, well, why don't you guys come in with us? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so Betty has said, currently Northern Ireland farmers ship milk to China and lambs to France, could this change? And her other kind of part of that was, you know, what are the discussions around agriculture uh, and trade implications for Northern Ireland farmers who, who do seem to be kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place? Yeah, um, I mean, if you're in, in Northern Ireland and you send your product to Europe, you if you as long as you don't go through the mainland Britain, you're still in the single market. You're still at your that's kind of the, the perk for Northern Ireland is you're still in the uh, single market. So it's as if things never changed. But if you pass through Britain for whatever reason, that's when things get complicated. Uh, if you go through Ross Lair in Wexford in the southeast of Ireland, directly to France, it's no different than it has been for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. So that's why I mentioned trade flows, because Britain was a huge land bridge for Irish exports and imports. And that is slowly changing. And, and it's not politically driven. It's businesses voting with their feet, saying, you know what, I can't afford to send my mushrooms to France through Britain because they'll perish. Uh, and I can't afford the extra, you know, 100 or 200 pounds or euros to make that happen. Mm -hmm. We have narrow margins. I have 100 people employed. If I do this, we will be uh, peripheral to the market. Okay, so it's an economic decision, as businesses do, uh, to find the cheapest solution. Mm -hmm. um, Caroline has asked, do we think Scotland will call for a referendum again? And do you see a United Ireland referendum in the future? Oh my goodness. That's not a loaded question. <laughs> um, okay, the first one. The Scots are interesting because I was just reading today where, like, there's a possibility Scotland will seek another referendum. Yeah. And I say seek because they need permission from London to have a referendum. They can have a referendum tomorrow, but it will be illegal. They need, and back in 14, or was it 13 or 14, they had their vote, uh, that was sanctioned by London, reluctantly, um, and the next one will have to be two. Now, that's kind of hard to see happening, but if the Scots are very much in support of the Scottish National Party, you could see London conceding that, maybe. But it's, a, it's an obstacle. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem, of course, is Scotland is economically, uh, technically a deprived area. It, it, it doesn't have the, the foundations to, be, to survive by itself. Um, and there have been rumors that they would try to reapply to join Europe and kind of go back to the way things were. The problem there is 
Brussels might welcome them back because the Scots have a good relationship with, with, with the EU. But the problem is you're going to have the Catalans saying, can we do the same? Or the Basque people or the Flemish, you know, can we break away from our country and join you? And that's a can of worms they do not want to open. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, the second question was Ireland, on, the, the, on the border poll. <laughs> Yeah, well, or a, a, a United Ireland um, referendum. Yeah, well, this is how long is a piece of string. It, it's at the moment, probably if there was a vote tomorrow, probably not, uh, in, in my view. Um, if after a few months or years, it becomes obvious that economically it's beneficial to be in the EU, um, then that will be a stronger motivation for people to, to support a, um, a United Ireland. Uh, what I will say, and this is just my view, the United Ireland that might result from that vote will not be the Ireland, uh, at least you and I, Elizabeth, grew up in. Yeah. Because if you're going to incorporate whatever, a million unionists or a million and a half unionists, they're not going to be happy with the tricolor and you know, all that kind of stuff. It's very symbolic. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have to have a much broader definition of Irish nationalism to be able to include everybody in a single island state. And that's a tall order, I think. That's that's a tough one to, we're, I mean, with the anniversaries at the moment, we're kind of grappling with who are we? Like, what did we do? And yeah, uh, was it worth it? And um, really kind of fundamental questions of identity. Uh, and we've come a long way in the past 30, 40 years. I mean, the Queen came to visit 10 years ago. Martin McGuinness met her. I mean, that blows my mind. Martin McGinn is shaking hands with the Queen. Yeah. Um, so things can change, uh, but it will not be the Irish nation, the Irish national nationalism that we grew up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So we have two Bob questions. One is from uh, Bob. What is the dynamic now with the Channel, uh, given Brexit? <sighs> yeah, the, the Channel is, is interesting because it's um, it's the most convenient way of getting from London to Brussels and Paris, but there is now a border. You now have to produce your passport. People, have to, it has to be checked, mm -hmm. and it's definitely hit traffic, uh, both um, material, excuse me, and people, and that's not good for business. Mm -hmm. So the border definitely restricts the number of people who want to travel, who can travel, uh, and they can only sustain that for so long before they go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, again, how much of that is Brexit? How much of this is COVID? Uh, you probably have, I'm guessing, 10% of the traffic you used to have because of COVID. Um, so really until COVID is no longer an issue, it's hard to say that yes, Brexit will bankrupt the Channel Tunnel. Mm -hmm. And then our other Bob said, and I mean, I love this question, if a revote was held today, what would be the chance that, that Britain would rejoin the EU? Because remember there was that talk initially like, oh, you all did it wrong and Cambridge Analytica lied and, you know, should we redo it, you know, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, the horse, had, the horse had bolted at that point, so it was a bit late. Um, it depends where you, it depends where you are. Scotland would still remain, Northern Ireland probably too. Um, it might be a bit closer or it might be a vote for remain. Mm -hmm. But the problem there is, do you just want to have a referendum every five years just for the fun of it? Or do you want to make a decision? And I couldn't see Europe letting it. You know, they were kind of dug in a bit. You know, they almost took it personally, sort of, you know, yeah. Yeah, but you'd be surprised. Like, they're, they're, they've they always been good at fudging stuff. And, um, like, I, I think they, they regret Britain leaving. Yeah. Uh, they accept it reluctantly. And if in the future they wanted to come back in, it's possible. Uh, I just don't know they'd have the same terms. I You know, I, I don't know how that would work mm -hmm. uh, in terms of welcoming them back. It would definitely be awkward <laughs> to say the very least. Video, you know, of them taking down the flag. I don't know if any of you all saw that, but like it was so, you know, ooh, <laughs> it was very quietly done. And, you know, and of course it became an instant meme, but they were all business. Like, you know, there was no sorrow kind of, and you know, I, I just thought that was an interesting how they handled it. And, you know, and the sim symbolism of taking down the flag and folding it and walking off, you know. It's very interesting. Uh, Abby has asked, kind of uh, talking about the EU, what do you make of the EU blinking first, so to speak, about the Northern Ireland protocol over COVID vaccines? Well, if you listen to what the Commission President von der Leyen said recently in front of the Parliament, 
she first of all kind of apologized for like a mess up like a i mean it was a cock up there's no other way to put it um and the thought is that it was first of all did she make as a president she either knew about it or she didn't if she knew about it then she agreed with it because it wouldn't go out otherwise if she didn't know about it then that creates questions as to her authority but um what I heard was that it was a kind of a Friday night decision among lawyer or among the legal team that oh we got to stop the COVID vaccines because it was a huge fight between the EU and um, Astra, uh, AstraZeneca uh, about the, the 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 virus vaccine and pulled into that was the border so it wasn't that the EU attacked the border for the sake of it. it was that in an effort to stop the COVID vaccines leaving where they were manufactured in Belgium, mm -hmm. into, into Britain, um, they thought, hey, why not just stop them at the border? Mm -hmm. And like, like, duh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like within three hours, it was, it was reversed, mm -hmm. but it was done. Mm -hmm. And that gave so much oxygen to Michael Gove and to, to the British government. Like, have you seen these guys across the water? They can't even organize a you know pissed up in a brewery so they definitely exposed themselves it was a really stupid mistake some people say she should have resigned I, I i i could see that happening but not now but i could see but I, I don't know if that would change things but it's definitely ammunition for the british in terms of um well you pulled it yeah you you blinked first mm -hmm. um kathy and chris just kind of commented on the new Tory voters in the north of England would probably still be for leave, you know. Um, I th one of the interesting things is I think, and I mean, you could debate the whole, because I'm still flummoxed by the actual original referendum and, you know, Cameron's attitude and Theresa May, God love her, you know. Um, and now this documentary that came out about Cambridge Analytica, I think, you know, shed a lot of light to one. But there really was a sense like that a lot of the voters didn't understand, you know, you own a house in France or Marbella in Spain, you know, you're from England, you're retired, you're living over there, you know, it's going to affect you. Like you might be happy to keep little Britain British, but you actually live six months of the year in Europe and, and you know, now apparently they're complaining because they can't get mushy peas and, you know, Jaffa cakes. And, and so you sometimes wonder, like, the disconnect between what they thought was only going to affect maybe their own domestic policy without realizing how much they also got out of Europe, you know. And so there has to be more buyer's remorse than we know, maybe. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, sometimes they, people dig themselves into their hole further when they're challenged. That, that's human. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and Chris is right, the, the, the new Tory voters who traditionally voted Labour because they're blue collar, uh, working class, they were gung ho for, for leave. Yeah. Now, the irony is, of course, that the first thing, the places in the country that will suffer job wise are those very places where they have car manufacturing, where they have like chemical manufacturing. Uh, those areas will, will suffer first. The, the, the city will be fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. <laughs> For, for good or for bad, they'll survive. They'll modify, they'll be in the cloud uh, and they'll be fine. But you can't make cars in the cloud. So no. it's real material. Mm -hmm. And the problem was that the focus of the British government was to emphasize exports of real things, traditional things like, as I said, cars or uh, British uh, production, whatever industrial production they have. Because that's very, and the fish was the same. It's a very nationalistic and a very sensitive, and it brings people together, and it's it's an identity. It's who they are. Mm -hmm. If you if you had the same argument over, uh, you know, derivatives or or you know bonds or or shares, like oh, you know, yawn, no one's going to pay attention. But because it's very real stuff they were talking about, people latched onto it, and unfortunately, it's the manufacturing sector that is going to be hit before the financial sector, um, which is which is kind of ironic, but sad. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, again, you know, it depends where you go. Like it's, it's, you know, in certain areas, young people would have, you know, the younger generation are really mad because something like Erasmus, which I went on, and I, I don't know if you did Elizabeth, but uh, I went to France for a year uh, under this study program when I was in college. 
and it was amazing. Like yeah. I studied nothing, but I learned so much. Yeah. So well, the Irish government was, uh, keeping that on for Northern Irish kids. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think they are keeping it on for Northern Ireland because because if, if you're from Northern Ireland, you have the right to passports. Yeah. So that's fine. It's just British young British kids yeah. will not have the same opportunity. Mm-hmm. And and they're rightfully annoyed at that. Uh, and it was a little bit spiteful to, to take that off the table because it was offered that they would maintain Erasmus. Mm-hmm. But I think the British were looking for a full departure and trying to avoid uh, indoctrinating their young people by sending them to Europe. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's incredible, really. Time between Britain and, and the mainland, in a way. Yeah. Um, so in a way, like, you know, maybe COVID has kind of been a little bit of a blessing because it, it seems like there's been a softened landing. I, I, you know, I remember the hysteria, like when obviously pre-COVID, but people were talking about, oh, the flowers will be dead in the back of the truck, you know, coming in from Holland and food rotting inside in trucks. Maybe because COVID has stopped travel and all those things kind of anyway, you know, we're not seeing what we thought we would see with with border control and with trade and and even with our own, you know, kind of traveling for uh, for vacation. So it, it yeah. might kind of stretch out how long it's going to be before we fi- feel the effects of, of Brexit. Yeah, and the other thing to remember too is that this has been in the works for four years. And British companies who've been able to, or had the savvy to do it, have s- stockpiled. Yeah. So in a sense, they were expecting January 1st to be a real mess, but they had six months or a year worth of material in their, in their warehouse so they were going to coast. Mm-hmm. So that would have reduced the traffic anyway, because they wouldn't be as much of a demand for material because they've stockpiled over the past couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem is that, um, like, I was trying to, I, I, I spoke to someone at the, uh, who was involved in the British Irish Chamber of Commerce, and they were saying that the British government is now telling British businesses who complain about the cost of doing business with Europe, they're suggesting, one of their suggestions is, Perhaps you should open an office on the mainland, on on in in Europe, and like. I know it, it makes sense, economic sense, you know, whatever. But like, was this what we voted for? Moving jobs from Britain to Europe or to Ireland or wherever you know, wherever it goes. So I, I think what it, the whole thing has shown is like, we are so interlinked, and we don't realize it till something goes wrong, mm-hmm. um, that we just take it for granted. We don't understand it, partly because we're not interested, partly because it doesn't bother us. But it's only when things start breaking down, we realize, my God, mm-hmm. we rely on that so much, or you know, we didn't expect this to happen. Mm-hmm. And you're beginning to see unexpected or un- unpredicted uh, impacts of Brexit as well. Mm-hmm. Caroline said you, you kind of started to touch on it. Could you talk a little bit about maybe financial markets and, and all of that stuff being moved you know, out of London to possibly um, Amsterdam or places? Yeah, so um, it's kind of a trickle. It's been a trickle for the past few years. Um, uh, places like uh, I have a friend working as he's a lawyer attorney in, in Dublin, and he said like business is booming. Um, what they're having is, is like smaller offices in Dublin or Paris, or mostly in Dublin or Paris or Frankfurt, because um, they're still kind of hedging their bets, but they're buying property, they're or they're renting property, and they're getting ready for whatever happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and if there was no Brexit they those jobs would probably stay in London Mm -hmm. um so it's definitely they're losing jobs but not wholesale yet Mm -hmm. um I think what will happen though is that a lot it's such a cosmopolitan city London that a lot of the people involved in the city are not even from Britain they're from Europe they're from anywhere around the world and depending on how they handle the immigration issues you know if they make it difficult for Europeans to work in in Britain that's going to reduce their foreign employees but but like we see over here foreigners can be really helpful if they're really skilled Mm -hmm. and by losing that skill you're making yourself less competitive and that's the kind of balancing act Mm -hmm. controlling immigration yet remaining competitive enough Mm -hmm. to survive in the world well and even nurses and doctors you know like aside from competitive and markets and financial their own NHS system like is I can't remember what the the statistics were but there's a lot of you know non-national we'll call them uh, almost 30 almost 30 percent of the NHS staff are European not not international they're European yeah yeah which yeah yeah. um so I'm trying to refresh this I'm just I'm afraid you're typing questions and I'm not seeing them but it looks like 
I am not seeing questions. <laughs> so does anyone have any other questions or comments? I, I read somewhere lately that I can't remember, was it one of the major people that had advocated for leave, you know, basically had to set up a domain name uh, with a dot EU. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah, instead of a, a .com. And Dennis, thank you, very informative. You answered the questions that they um, oh, good. were trying to find answers to. Good, thanks, Dennis and Linda. Um, anyone else, Chris or Kathy or um, anyone on Facebook? I'm, I am trying to manage the Facebook queries too. Uh, so Chris said, is Ireland actively recruiting UK businesses to use Ireland as their EU base in the same way that US? Yeah, that you like so that's... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure how aggressive they are, mm. but they're definitely open, obviously. They're open to, uh, to new business. And I, I think it happens up at a higher level uh, a pretty high level in terms of distribution of, 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 of workforce, but they've definitely benefited. Dublin has definitely benefited from um, the uncertainty, really. You know, it's not a disaster in the city. It's just an uncertainty. And if there's one thing that banks don't like, it's uncertainty. Mm -hmm. well, probably several things, but that's one thing they do not like is, is lack of predictability. Yeah, yeah. So um, at the moment, it looks like maybe the biggest repercussions as such will be, you know, kind of social more than anything else, Bob. And Jeff said, thank you. I appreciate your knowledge. Another wonderful evening. <laughs> and uh, they want you to come back later on and update us again. That's great, guys. But yeah, Hopefully it will be in, in person, right? <laughs> in person, I know. Yeah, yeah. It is, you know, but I, so I think that is the interesting thing. Like the, the whole Irish question, I guess, is you know, what we would probably be the most interested in, you know, and, and I think you did raise a very interesting point. Like, it's one thing to say, oh, sure, like we can take the six counties, but, you know, how likely are they, are, how likely is it that we could keep, you know, the tricolor and things? And, and that wasn't really something I think that Irish people have been thinking about, like we're, you know, we're, I'm thinking, how can we afford it more than anything else, you know, but um, it's, it's yeah. interesting socially like what it would look like you know yeah i mean if you take something i'm trying to think of another example but like when 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 germany was united in 1991 mm. you had the west germans and the east germans who had been separated for at that stage 40 years more or less which is a generation it's not you know not nothing yeah for 100 years geographically but in terms of ethnicity or nationalist tendencies the island has been separated for hundreds of years the irish people north and south so if you take the German example of bringing people together after just 40 years, there have been a lot of complications in Germany and East Germans resent the kind of what they see as the haughtiness of the West Germans and the West Germans treat the East Germans like they're second, you know, second class citizens. So there's tensions there just after 40 years. But you can imagine if there is a United Ireland, we're going to have to define who we are from scratch again, I mean, in, in a sense, if, if you really want to include everybody as an Irish person, you need to at least recognize their background, uh, which is which is not an easy mm. challenge. Well, as you said, the commemorations, you know, like do we put up the RIC, some of whom were Irish speakers who were Catholics, you know, and, and can their names go on a roll of just a, an alphabetical list of who died in 1916? And, you know, it's yep. been, based every month you know and, and I you know I, I think historians and politicians are worried about now we're coming up to the civil war era so hard and all as it was with the war of independence where we thought there was kind of a clear enemy you know and a clear hero what is it going to do to us you know to relive 22 23 you know yeah so, yeah, yeah no for sure um I think I think Michal Martin is regretting becoming Taoiseach at this moment the, the happiest the happiest man in Ireland is Leo Varadkar. He's like, okay, dude, yeah. <laughs> the vacation. Yeah. Um, oh, so one person is interested in your background. They said, where are you broadcasting from? So you are technically at home in, in near Saratoga. I'm in, I'm in the, the sprawling metropolis of Niskiunis, Schenectady. Schenectady. Um, the background you see is my hometown, Abbey Field, West Limerick. Uh, it's the uh, it's the kind of the good side of the tracks compared to Listowel. Uh, Not at all. Culture is over the border. Um, <laughs> but this is Father. Ca oh, sorry, this is Father Casey here, who's you know who's uh, waving to us to behave, um, and it doesn't work because it's it's got like one pub for every five people, uh, so it, a lot of misbehaving going on. Yeah. But uh, it's a small town. It's, it's where I grew up, and and haven't seen it now for three years. So 
-hmm. it would be nice to to visit again mm -hmm. um we have one more just kind of a comment but um the dup i suppose we're going to talk about them like that they're not really even ready prepared to talk about the possibility of a united ireland but the DUP is in a kind of an interesting because even though they're in a way the majority in power, they don't. I don't know if they represent the majority of, particularly as regards Remain and Leave and all. Um, so what? Where are the DUP at? Very grammatically incorrect there, but the, well. And so Aaron I mean, says kind of piggybacking. Why? What do you think about the DUP boycotting? You know, Brexit discussions and stuff. Well, I, I mentioned earlier on that people when they're back into a corner, sometimes they will just dig in more. Yeah. sometimes, but this is their identity. Yeah, they have had their backs against the wall in terms of their British identity since. That's kind of in okay. a sense, their, their, their moment, their forging moment mm -hmm. uh, was mm -hmm. was the you know the Battle of the Boyne, all this way mm -hmm. back. But they love a fight, and and that's that's how they're brought up. The DUP had a problem recently where their their popularity is decreasing because they're seen as being pro Brexit, which obviously in Northern Ireland is not the most popular view. Uh, they're seeing as being old school um, and their popularity decreased to like 19% apparently. So that's not a majority. Um, so part of their action is motivated by gaining back political power. And part of it is just their nature. They were not for a United Ireland, obviously. They were for a total Brexit. They were for a border on the island of Ireland. And the fact that the British government actively sought not to have a border on on the land annoyed them greatly mm -hmm. and during the theresa may time mm -hmm. they actually held the balance of power and they could dictate to her what she did mm -hmm. with boris's huge majority he kind of he, he threw them under the bus a year and a half ago willingly as he does um and they haven't forgotten that but british government is their only real hope like they're not going to get sympathy from any other quarter and um you know there's part of me thinking they're kind of running against the wheels of history here they're kind of old school they don't they're very uh, unwilling to compromise mm -hmm. and um they're you know it should be interesting to see what happens i mean if 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 they um if the economy tanks in northern ireland um and they're in power will they be blamed um what, what confused me about them, we kind of showed their true colors was Northern Ireland businesses being in the UK, but also in the EU, which was a deal, is in a sense a real bonus. Like if you make that, you can make that work very well to your favor, yet they oppose that. So for small businesses or any business in Northern Ireland, even though you might be ethnically loyalist and, you know, pro-union, the fact that this party is actively uh reducing your ability to do business is a negative uh, so there's all kinds of complications but they're definitely old school definitely hardline they've always been that way um and they're fighting for their lives in a sense at the moment mm -hmm. i can't remember um it might have been on one of the panels that you and um richard aldous you know did with us down in the museum but we were talking about how you know the the two extremists, the nationalists and the unionists, were both going further out to the fringe, you know, and then the other parties were kind of coming more centrist. So it's it's interesting to see that, like, that, you know, we are having this more, uh, you know, fringe. Abby says, um, what do you make of the recent Lucid talk poll that showed an, a solid number of Northern Ireland residents saying they'd vote against United Ireland? Yeah, I mean, um, change is always hard. Um, it's the majority have you know traditionally been pro-union in mm -hmm. the north uh that's changing slowly you know catholic families being catholic families tend to have <laughs> more exponential growth shall we say um numerically but there's also the fact that the unionism and, and, and nationalism is kind of diluting in certain areas too mm -hmm. people don't identify as unionist uh, you know they mm -hmm. technically identify as british and irish because they have two passports so that's an that's an interesting um departure which i think for the younger generation will mean that it's not such a big they don't have to choose mm -hmm. and that's a big plus um and that that's what everyone wants to keep despite brexit the ability of people in northern ireland 
not to force them to choose sides because that never worked out in the past. So, and Caroline just said um, it was part of the Good Friday Agreement, you know, which is going to get the Americans riled up like that there should not be a border in Ireland. So it's bigger than just DUP or even Europe. It's America, you know, an international law with the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah, and, and like if for whatever reason the British decided we were going to have a border on the island of Ireland on land, yeah. then you'd have the Irish caucus here up in arms. Yeah. And a trade deal that would happen between the US and Britain would be jeopardized by unilateral British action in terms of creating a border. So they're in a kind of a corner, especially more with the new administration who would have been pro-Remain. Mm -hmm. The Trump administration would have been pro-Brexit, uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. But now Johnson has to kind of re reconfigure or recalibrate uh, his relationship with, uh, with DC. Yeah, yeah. He's dealing with a male man, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, and a very proud, you know, male man. Indeed. Uh, um, so I think we don't have any more questions. I'm just checking Facebook again one last time. I'm getting things on my cell phone. It's all action stations like here. You like air traffic control. I know, I know. I, 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 I'm not great at the multitasking. <laughs> um, but I think people, you know, some people have logged off already and um, there are no outstanding issues. So we'll definitely have to have you back, Peter. And, um, you know, it's easy now that we can all do it from the comfort of our sitting rooms <laughs> and ignore the mess in the background. Um, but thank you all, everyone, for coming out. Jean says, yeah. And um, Christine, great. so we'll have you back, you know, and um, probably we've loads of other things to talk about uh, some other time too. So thank well, you. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for listening. And I hope I hope it was helpful. Yeah. That's great, Peter. Thank you. Or Mila Mahagot, as, as I've said. Okay. <laughs> Thanks you for having me, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you. I'll, I'll call you soon. <laughs> Grant. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.